Greetings, this is Greg. Why is it that Germany's Messerschmitt Bf 109 had such short range? Most World War II aircraft enthusiasts know that during the Battle of Britain, the 109 was badly hampered by range issues. After crossing the English Channel from bases in France, it only carried enough fuel for about 20 minutes over England and only about 10 minutes over London. A lot of 109s ran out of fuel on the way back to their bases, and it's often argued that the plane's short range was a primary factor in the Luftwaffe's failure in the Battle of Britain. I'll go into this issue in detail in this video, but first I'll give you the super short answer. The 109 has a really big engine and it's in a really small airplane, which doesn't have much room for fuel tanks. Additionally, I want to state that the question of why the 109 has such short range isn't even the right question, which we'll see. However, it is a question that's often asked, so I'll answer it here fully. Prior to World War II, nobody was 100% sure what air combat in the 1940s was going to look like. Every country had their own ideas and doctrines on this subject, and those doctrines had some effect on range. For example, the Fokker D-21 was intended to defend either the Netherlands or some island in the Dutch East Indies. Both places are locations where after you take off, you can see border to border or shore to shore. Thus, range wasn't a super high priority for this airplane. At the other end of the scale, you have the Japanese who were planning an offensive campaign in the Pacific. Thus, range was a higher priority. The Germans were heavily focused on performance and their primary way of getting the performance was to use a very advanced, very large displacement engine in the smallest possible airframe. The BF-109 is essentially the largest, most advanced liquid-cooled engine that they had at the time, combined with the smallest possible airframe around it, with just enough room left over for essential equipment, uh, obviously including a pilot and some weaponry. Why such short range? Well, I want to start off by saying that the 109's range wasn't really that short by standards of the day. If you compare the various European fighters that were present early in the war, you'll see that the vast majority had similar range limitations. For example, if we compare the BF-109E as used in the Battle of Britain with the British Spitfire it fought against, both have quite similar range numbers. That makes sense. The Spitfire carries 102 gallons of internal fuel compared with the 109's 106 gallon tank. The 109's engine is much larger, but also has a more advanced fuel delivery system, which helps offset that extra size, and it's in a smaller airplane. Both of these planes have ranges of about 400 miles. Sources vary a bit, but not much. The Spitfire has slightly more range, largely due to its smaller engine, but not much more. We're only talking about maybe 5%. If we compare the 109 to the Yak-1, again, its range is pretty similar, often slightly less depending on exact aircraft variants and pilot techniques, meaning the Yak probably had slightly less range than the 109. Uh, the Yak has slightly greater fuel capacity, but a larger and more thirsty engine. The Yak was powered by the Kilmov M105, which at 35.1 liters was even larger than Germany's DB601, which was powering the early war 109s, and the Kilmov is quite a bit larger than the Merlin. So, if compared to other European fighters that were flying in early World War II, the 109's range was pretty typical. So the 109 didn't really have short range as compared with its contemporaries, but it did have very short range compared with U.S. aircraft, specifically the P-51 Mustang. And that's the comparison that's the most striking. So why did the 109 have so little range compared with the P-51? The P-51 Mustang carried 269 gallons of internal fuel. That's a lot more than the 109's 106 gallons. Why that big difference? The P-51 had a huge advantage over the 109 and most other World War II fighters, in that it was a very late design. In fact, the Merlin engine variant we're talking about here and using for comparison didn't enter production until the middle of 1943. That means its designers had the advantage of knowing just how important range would be, and they understood the distances it would need to fly in the various theaters of World War II. 
Thus, the P-51 was designed to carry a lot of fuel. There are many versions of the 109, but for comparisons with the P-51, I'll use the 109G models. The Gs were the most numerous versions, and the types most likely to do battle with the P-51 during the war. It's actually a bit difficult to get detailed information on the performance data for the 109G, or some of that data, but most sources put its range at about 450 miles on internal fuel. I've seen numbers as low as 400 miles and as high as 530. I suspect the latter, if achievable, was done at a very low power setting. I'll use the 450 number for this discussion, as it's probably the range done at typical cruise power, although the power setting involved in range numbers is exactly the sort of detailed information that is really tough to find for the German aircraft. For the P-51, on the other hand, we have really good range data. In this chart, you can see that it can go 980 miles. Furthermore, it can do it at altitude at over 400 miles per hour. If throttled back to 370 miles an hour, still smoking fast, it can travel about 1,500 miles. These numbers don't factor in the less efficient takeoff and climb phase of flight, so the actual range is a bit less, but it gives a rough idea of how far the plane can travel. So there isn't any real mystery here. The P-51 had about 2.5 times the amount of fuel capacity of the 109, and it goes about 2.5 times farther. If we multiply the 109G's 450 mile range by 2.5, we get 1,125 miles, and in the example cited here, in the official manual under typical cruise conditions, the P-51 had a range of about 1,100 miles. This shows that the planes travel pretty similar distances on a given amount of fuel. Now, why didn't they put more fuel tanks or simply larger fuel tanks in the 109? Well, the answer is really simple. The 109's relatively small airframe just didn't have the space. The area aft of the cockpit was largely used up, and more fuel back there would have created weight and balance problems. Installing tanks in the wings would have been an even bigger problem. They would have had to do a complete redesign just to fit them. There's already a lot of stuff in the 109 wings. Uh, mechanisms for flaps and slats and ailerons and landing gear and weaponry, and the wings are smaller to begin with, so bigger problem as compared to other airplanes in terms of fitting stuff in. Plus adding weight out in the wings would have hurt the 109's roll rate, which wasn't that great to begin with. In short, it just wasn't practical to increase the 109's fuel capacity. It should also be said that based on the ranges of subsequent German fighter designs, it doesn't appear that range was ever a primary design consideration for the German fighters of World War II. So I don't think that a major redesign and retooling of the production line to allow 109s to carry larger tanks while also trying to keep up production during the war was ever really an option, let alone a priority for the Germans. Next, we have to talk about the engine. Large engines tend to use a lot of fuel and the 109's engine was large. The 109G's Daimler-Benz DB605 displaced 35.7 liters, or 2,178 cubic inches. The P-51's engine displaced 27 liters, or 1,649 cubic inches. That gives the 109 an extra 8.7 liters of engine under the cowling. That is a lot. The concept of shoving a big engine into a small vehicle is a common recipe for high performance in both cars and airplanes, probably boats and trains and everything else. It's a concept that's still in use today. And the 109 took this concept to the extreme by World War II fighter standards. In fact, the 109's engine was larger than just about any conventional U.S. or British liquid-cooled engines. The Russians had a larger engine, but it wasn't as advanced. And, of course, the U.S. had air-cooled radials that were larger, but generally in larger aircraft and, of course, far less streamlined. So, that big DB605 isn't helping the range issue. However, it does have some high-tech features, some of which were pretty unique to German designs. First of all, it has fuel injection. Now, fuel injection offers several advantages. Probably the most talked about is the ability to keep the engine running 
during negative G maneuvers, something the early Spitfires couldn't do. While this is an advantage, it is not the primary advantage. The primary advantage is in power. Fuel injection allows air to flow to and from the supercharger without being obstructed by the carburetor's venturi or venturis. This reduces the drive power to and heat out of the supercharger. Additionally, fuel injection gives the big 605 more accurate fuel distribution, allowing for more protection against knock, since you don't have to worry as much about one cylinder being a little leaner than another. In short, fuel injection allows for more power. The negative G advantage is secondary, and against most U.S. airplanes, that advantage is non-existent anyway, since most U.S. engines and fighters could handle negative Gs for short periods of time, much like the 109. Now, I want to mention that there's a myth going around that states that the carburetor was superior due to a cooling effect after the Venturi. This is absolute hogwash. Now, it's true that there is a pressure drop after the Venturi that causes a cooling effect, but you have to put energy into the system to get that pressure drop. In other words, the supercharger has to force air through the restriction in the first place. The carburetor has that pressure drop because it has to in order for it to work, not because it's going to increase performance. That's why you don't see designers shoving Venturis into the intakes of fuel-injected engines to try and gain some cooling effect. The losses from shoving air through the Venturi far offset the small gains from the slight cooling effect that you're getting after the Venturi. Now it's worth pointing out that race cars started going to fuel injection in the 1950s and today nearly every modern race car runs with fuel injection if the rules allow it. I don't know of any cases where they don't. They're doing that not because of the negative G advantage. These are cars. And they're sure as heck not shoving Venturis in there to cause a pressure drop. Fuel injection simply gives more power and fuel economy than a carburetor. And I know that there's some places on the internet where in discussions of World War II airplanes, somebody is saying otherwise, but that's incorrect. Now the 109's engine had some other advanced features. It had a supercharger with infinitely variable speed control. This is highly unusual and quite advanced. To this day, even in the automotive aftermarket, there hasn't been anything like it. Nearly all other superchargers in aircraft had either one or two speeds. Some of the best U.S. airplanes, uh, the Corsair, for example, had essentially three. But the German drive system was the most advanced. I have a whole video on that German drive system here on this channel. Now the big engine the Germans were using also had extensive use of roller bearings. It had four valves per cylinder, overhead cams, all the other features common to the best engines of the day. Furthermore, some versions had water methanol injection. I, I have a video on that. Uh, it's uh, in my video on the Messerschmitt uh, BF109K. And some also had nitrous oxide injection. So we know why the 109 had such short range. It's simply a matter of a really large engine in a really small plane. Didn't have much room for big fuel tanks. The fuel injection system is partially offset, uh, or the correction, I should say, the fuel injection system partially offsets the consumption caused by all the engine displacement, but it wasn't a magic bullet. You still have over 35 liters of engine to feed with only 106 gallons of internal fuel. Of course, external drop tanks would add to the range, but that's not really relevant to this discussion for two reasons. First, the Germans essentially didn't use them in the Battle of Britain when range was a big issue. Second, for comparison purposes, drop tanks don't alter the, compar the comparison, certainly not in favor of the 109. The U.S. airplanes could carry larger drop tanks, sometimes more of them, and extend their range by a greater margin. In other words, the 109 still has the same comparative issue when it's carrying a drop tank. It can't carry a lot of fuel in it. Uh, the P-51 can. Earlier, I said that asking why the 109 had such short range isn't really the right question, and it's not. The reason is twofold. First, its range wasn't that short compared to contemporary European fighters, and second, 
The answer is so simple, its range was a result of the big engine and fuel and the small fuel capacity. The real question is, why is it that a typical 109G like a G6 model with its huge engine with all its advanced features shoved into a tiny airplane was about 50 miles per hour slower than the P51D? That's a question I really want to address in another video. In fact, I have addressed it in another video uh, which I'll put a link to in the description. In fact, any of these other videos that I've mentioned in this one that are relevant, I'll put in a link. I think that uh, specific topic is pretty interesting, but it's large and complex. Thus, the question of why the 51 is faster than the 109, even though it has a smaller engine, really needs its own video. Thanks for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe. Leave comments below to add to the discussion. I do appreciate it, and I try my best to reply to every one of them. A quick note, some of you may be aware that this is a remake of a previous video on this topic. I had that video down for a while because I wanted to make a few small changes to it, which you're seeing here. I also want to thank all my subscribers and especially my supporters on Patreon who normally get early access to my aviation videos. Although in this case, since I'm just reloading an older video, or that's mostly what I'm doing, everyone got this one at the same time. Anyhow, hope everybody's having a great day and goodbye.